Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are so thankful again to be here, to be joined with brothers and sisters of like faith. We are so privileged to be able to sit and hear the word and, and not only to hear it, but to utilize it and to do something with it. And I pray, Father, that our ears will be open, not only our physical ears, but our spiritual ears, that they would be, we would be receptive to hear. Because it's not by chance that we're here. You brought us here for a reason. And we thank you for that. I pray your anointing upon Dr. Ray. I pray, Father, that he will just feel an unction, that he will feel the supernatural presence of the Holy Spirit touching him, ministering through him and to him. And I thank you again for your hand upon his life. Now we ask you also to bless this food, and may we be a blessing to others, and we give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give Dr. Ray a hand as he comes to minister. And so, I, so on these, we're in the last days now, right? And you know, there are several places in the scripture where it talks about that God is going, has, has sealed up this information that God wants to give to us until the last days, right? Okay. So one of the things for us to understand what God got planned for us in the last days is that we have to be listening to what he's saying. Because if we're not listening to what he's saying, all we're doing is we're just sort of, sort of continuing on uh, doing the same things we've been doing forever, right? So God wants us to be listening to him. So one of the issues are is that God gave us this gave us this Bible, this book, and all this information, and he gave us the New Testament and the Old Testament, correct? And, and the purpose of him giving us this New Testament and the Old Testament is because this is our inheritance. Did you all hear that, right? So this book is our inheritance, because you, you have to add another word to the testament here. This is God's will and testament. What's a will and testament? A will and testament is what you what happens, when, what you receive when somebody dies, correct? Okay? So as a matter of fact, it even says it in Galatians. It says there, it says, when the testator dies, who is a testator? Well, the one who made the will was Jesus, right? He is a testator. So when the testator dies, then all the stuff that's written in the Bible then is given to you. So now you have to, so now you have to be thinking about the Bible in a whole different way. If this is your inheritance, then you start to need, start to not treat this Bible as it's just history. Are we treating it like it's just history? These are just stories in the Bible that that have nothing to do with you. No, they have everything to do with you. Okay. So the other thing you need to know is this, is that everything is written in here then has to do with you and the purpose, the purpose he wrote it in the scripture is to teach you something, okay? So it's supposed to be teaching you something. All these things that are written in the Bible are supposed to be teaching you something. So now, so how many of you believe that you are the elect? Did you hear that? Because that's a very important thing for you to start speaking those words, are you? God has, God, many are called, correct? Has God called you to be the elect? Yes. Now, how about the next part? Is many are called and few are chosen. Now, who's doing the choosing? Us. Yep, you are doing the choosing. How many of you have chosen to be the elect? Amen. See, there's not just because you have to choose this thing. You have to make you have to make a decision, right? That you are the elect. Hallelujah, right? So let's write let's write the one of the words up here. We have to get down in our system here. And the word is what? Believe. Okay. So 
So let's read this. Let's go to John chapter 6, okay? Now in this scripture, this is the feeding of the uh, 5,000, okay? Now one of the things you have to get in mind here is that there were more, more than 5,000 people. They only counted the men, so there's probably more like 15 or 20,000, weren't there? Okay, so this scripture is about first, first in here. Remember now, this is, this is to teach you something. All these scriptures are to teach you something. So in this scripture, right, they're feeding 5,000, but so the first thing that happens, right, they're out there in the middle of nowhere, and, uh, and the disciples come up to Jesus and they say, okay, we need, to, we need to send the people back so they can get something to eat. And Jesus then is going to test them. So how does Jesus test them? He says, okay, well, what, well, what do you have here? And remember, he says, well, you got what? You got two fish and you got five loaves of bread. Well, now, in our own human thinking, that could not feed uh, uh, 5,000 people, could it? Right? So remember, he's testing because one of the things you have to get inside of you is this, is that there's a scripture, it's written in Hebrews chapter 2. It says, right, <clears throat> first it talks about, about God placing under your feet all of, all of your enemies. Did you hear that one? He's going to place under your feet all of your enemies. So what is your, what is your enemy? <laughs> so somebody knows the answer, right? That's your protege. <laughs> so your enemy is death. Did you all hear that, right? So your enemy is death. So he's going to place your enemy. Now, what you have to realize this thing about death, though, what death really represents to you here in this scripture is everything in your life that you're doing and what you're doing to try to prevent you from dying. So what, all, what kind of things are you doing in your life to prevent you from dying? Well, the number one thing is you're trying to make sure you always have enough food to eat, right? Yeah. Right? You want to make sure you've got a, a roof over your head. You want to make sure you've got a job so you can buy food and rent a house or buy a house or buy clothes, right? These are all issues about th this issue about death. Okay, so now here in this scripture, so God says he's going to put all these things under your feet. What does that mean if he's going to put all these issues under your feet? That means that, means that when we talk about food, then we have to talk about food in a whole different way, don't we? If he's put, if he's put the issue about food under your feet, what does that mean then? Does that mean then that you're going to have to go out and work to buy food? If, you, if you're still having to go out and work to buy food, then he hasn't put that issue about food under your feet, has he? Yes. Did you hear that, right? Mm -hmm. So here's Jesus now in this situation in chapter 6, right? Is that he is now going to show to them, right, that they don't have to work to get food. Right? So what does he do? Remember, they bring the... So this boy has these two fish in the, in the five loaves, right? And so then what they do, right, so then he multiplies them all, right? Not only does he multiply the fish and the food, there were, if there were 20,000 people sitting there, they certainly had to have one, one, more than one basket to hand out the food, didn't they? So he also multiplied the baskets, the, the, the means by which to uh, give all this food to everybody. Did you hear that, right? Did, now, did he do that? Because remember, if you read the scripture, he said he... He said these things as a trial, a test for the disciples. He was trying to show them something here, show them that, no, they did not have to leave and go and find food for themselves, that God would provide for them. Is God providing for you? Amen. Now, if you are the elect, then you have to come to this realization. Are you going, as the elect, because when I use this word elect, that does not tell you too much about your relationship with him. 
Did you all hear that? So what kind of relationship do you have with him? <clears throat> because you have to realize all the stuff we're talking about, basically this scripture, is talking about relationships. That's what it's talking about, isn't it? But, <clears throat> but what you don't realize when we talk about relationship, the Bible does not talk about just one relationship. It talks about a series of relationships, okay? So, for example, when you received Jesus as your personal Savior, did you have a relationship with God? I did. Well, I'm glad somebody did. <laughs> yeah, I really did. Did you hear that? Yeah, we all had a relationship with God. Did you hear that? When? We receive Jesus as our personal Savior. But you have to also understand that God has not called you just to, just to be, a re, be born again. He's called you into a, a, a more advanced relationship than that. He's called you. How many of you are seated in the throne with him? Now listen, that is a completely different relationship than being, than being uh, receiving your salvation, receiving Jesus as your personal Savior. So now, so you have to get this idea is that all these things, all these things that God's trying to teach us in the scripture are also all about relationships. <coughs> because God wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to redeem you back into this relationship that he had with you from the start. Yeah. Right? You know, we've talked about that for years, but we've never understood what he was about most of this stuff. Okay? Hallelujah, Right? So when I say to you, the elect, the, that doesn't tell, it doesn't tell me or you what kind of a relationship you have, does it? Okay? So that means you have to, also then you have to start making a choice. Okay, are you, see, and God, remember when God, when Moses came down from the, from the mountain, not only did Moses have the, have the law, but he also had a, a plan to build this tabernacle in the wilderness, correct? Yeah. Now, do you under, if you understand, why did, Moses bring, why did Moses bring a plan to build a tabernacle in the wilderness? What was the objective of that? To show, us what like. to show you what heaven was like. But it's not just showing you what heaven's like. Did you hear that? It's also trying to teach you about what? relationships. Did you all hear that? It's also trying to teach you about relationships. So let me just draw a gross picture of the tabernacle in the wilderness for you. Okay. Because you have to realize this is a picture, a shadow. He uses the word shadow in that scripture. That's written in a Hebrews chapter 8. This is a shadow of heaven, okay? Okay? Now, one of the problems when we start talking about the tabernacle, one of the issues that we never talk about hardly are the people, right? You would think we, want, you would think we should talk about that more, right? But we... Basically, generally, when we talk about the tabernacle, we only talk about the structure, not the people. But you have to realize there's a whole list of things we need to get, grab a hold of. One is the people, okay, the people. But we also need to look at the material it's made out of. Now you think, well, why would we want to look at the material? Because the material, the materials that the tabernacle is built out, <coughs> that what does it represent? Relationships. You all understand that now. All this stuff we're talking about represents relationships. So when you start understanding this, then you start to look at it from a whole different perspective than you did before, okay? So there, we've got material, now we got, we've got clothes. Here's that. Now the clothes all represent, they represent relationships also. Then we've got these structures. 
Here, for example, we got the <coughs> we've got the Ark of the Covenant. Then we've got altars. We've got we've got candlesticks. We've got <coughs> the table of showbread. We've got the altar of incense. We've got the the altar of burnt sacrifice. The labor. All these things represent what relationships. Now, see, so God then, when we have this picture then, ultimately, hear this now, ultimately, you get to choose what kind of relationship you want. Did you hear that? Yes. You get to choose what kind of relationship you want, okay? So in this, we got people, right? Now, the people here, there were 600,000 people approximately out here, okay? Hear that? 600,000. There were 22,000 people in here. Okay? So why is that an important? Because you have to realize these people out here were never allowed in here. So that becomes a very important issue about you, about you making a choice about where you want to be in this thing. Listen, God is not a respecter of people. The only reason you'd be out here is why? You've chosen to be there. Okay? The reason why you get to be in here is why? You chose to get here. You've chosen to be in here. Okay? What's that? That's right. So now we got 600,000 people out here. Now it's very interesting, and there's also an order of these tribes. Did you hear that? So this tribe out here, now... When we, when we do an estimate, these are only 600,000 men, but there was probably somewhere around two and a half million. You know, it's been different estimates of how many people there are. There's approximately two and a half million people, okay? That means if you were, if you were out here, how far would you be away from the tabernacle? You would be a long ways away from the tabernacle, wouldn't you? You may be as much as 10 miles away from the tabernacle, right? So now, wait a minute, so if you're 10 miles away from the tabernacle and you're way out here, what kind of relationship do you have with the tabernacle in here? Pretty much, <laughs> not much of a relationship, right? But you're here, the reason why this person's out here is what? They've chosen to be there, remember? Man, everybody's called, is that correct? Yes. But, but few are chosen. See, people choose to be out here. Yeah. Did you hear that, right? That's why the scripture says, right? <clears throat> it talks about blessed are the meek for what? They shall inherit the earth. Did you hear it? What, what word did he use there? He didn't use that they're going to have the earth. He said they're going to what? Inherit, inherit, inherit the earth. earth. You remember, the, remember this whole Bible is about your inheritance. Why, did the, why was the earth their inheritance? Because they... They wanted the things of the earth. They chose the things the, of the that's earth. That's right. They, they, were important the they things wanted the things of the earth. They chose the things of the earth. So God did what? Gave God gave the desires of the earth. You have to hear that, right? What, why did he give them that? Because they wanted it. Well, you have to use the right scripture, right? Because they uh, gave, God gave them the desires of their heart. God gave them the desires of their heart. Did you all hear that one, right? So in this whole scenario, right, God is going to give you what? The desires of your heart. So that means you have to get your heart lined up where it's supposed to be, right? If your heart isn't in the right place, then you don't get the right things. If you set your heart on the things of the earth, then guess what you're going to get? The things of the earth. But if you set your heart on God, <clears throat> then, you, then you get the things of God. Now, so now, and when the children of Israel come out of Egypt, right? Remember, they travel through the, they travel through the wilderness, and eventually they get to the promised land. God, they enter into the promised land. <coughs> then they have this battles with the ice, and then pretty soon now, God, after they finish doing all that, then God is going to do what? Give them their inheritance. Did you hear that? Okay. So he starts giving the he starts giving the tribe of Reuben. This is the tribe of Reuben here. Okay. 
He gives the tribe of Reuben his, their inheritance. What did he give the tribe of Reuben? He gave the, the tribe of Reuben the inheritance outside the promised land. Why did he give why did he give the tribe of Reuben the inheritance outside the promised land? That's what they asked for. That's what they wanted, right? They wanted, the they wanted to stay on the other side. Now, you have to realize now the Jordan River in that scripture represents the boundaries of heaven. That means that they did not, they, they were not allowed to come in and inherit any part of the heaven. That's an interesting one, isn't it? So then he gives it. So then he gives the tribe of Ephraim, right? Their inheritance, okay. So their inheritance was inside the promised land. But what did he give them, though? He gave them land. He did not give them anything else. He gave them land. Remember, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So what he did is because they wanted the land. He gave the tribe of Ephraim land. So after he gave all these tribes all the land, okay, there was one he didn't give any land, which was the tribe of Levi. So when he got to the tribe of Levi, he says, I'm not going to give you any land. For you, for God, said, God, I will be your inheritance. Hallelujah. So the tribe of Levi inherited who? God. They inherited God. Why did the tribe of Levi inherit God? That was the heart's desire. Ah, very good. You get, you get that idea now, right? <laughs> the reason they inherited God, because that was the desire of their heart. Listen, if you want to inherit God, then listen, what do you have to do then? You have to make God the desires of your heart, that you would want to inherit God. Is that, is that something you can do? See, God wouldn't, God wouldn't show these things to us as to teach you about this unless this is what God wanted you to do. Did you all hear that, right? God is not a respecter of persons. Can you inherit God? Yes, we should choose to. That's right. Did you all hear that, right? So you get to make the choice. Do you want to inherit God? Or do you want to inherit the land? Which is it? See? God. Oh. And so you get to choose which one you're going to do. Did you all hear that? Praise the Lord, right? <laughs> okay, so we got now, so you got the people, right? No, we didn't talk about the material things, okay, the material things. So in the scripture, what he lists, what he does, and it's listed in, actually, in uh, Exodus chapter 25, okay? So Moses comes down off the mountain. Now the day that Moses comes out down off the mountain was on the Festival of Atonement. So it comes down off, off the mountain on <clears throat> in uh, Exodus chapter 24, the last verses of 24, with a plan to build the tabernacle of God. So the first thing you have to do when you build the tabernacle is do what? You have to gather all the materials, right? And so in chapter 25, he tells them all the materials together, okay? You hear that? And in that chapter, he lists them in order. Did you hear that? Order of significance. Did you all hear that? So the first one he lists is what? First one he lists is gold. Next one he lists is silver. Why, does he, why are these ones that he lists first? So, They're the ones. The most important. That's right. So gold in the scripture that covers the most important things in the scripture. What is the most important thing in the whole tabernacle? The throne. The throne of God or the Ark of the Covenant, right? They are the same thing, okay? So the Ark of the Covenant then is covered with gold, right? So now the next question is, now, he's listed a whole, a whole bunch of other things, but we won't write down, okay? We'll just put down, etc. Okay? Now, you have to get this idea. It's, it's the same issue. Are you, have you chosen to be gold? Now, what, see, one of our problems with when I say that to you is that we have a little confusion with that. See, and the confusion is we don't understand that there is physical gold, 
and their spiritual gold. You all hear that, right? So, so some people are seeking physical gold rather than spiritual gold. You all hear that one? They're, they're confused about it. They think that they, they, haven't, they haven't realized that there's, a, there's two issues here, right? So God doesn't want you to be seeking physical gold. Did you hear that? God wants you to be seeking spiritual gold. So that's one of the issues about this. Now the other issue about this is that the ta- there's, nothing, there's nothing in heaven that's dead. Is there anything in heaven that's dead? No, everything in heaven's living. Is that correct? That means, that means you are a living stone. Is that correct? Yes. You're a living stone, right? So now, but these living stones, they have different qualities. Some living stones are made out of gold. Some are gold living stones. Some are silver living stones. Some are brass living stones. Some are wood living stones. Did you hear that, right? Because they, that represents the order of things in the heaven. Did you all hear that? So now, God, again, God is not a respecter of persons. You can be a gold living stone in the throne of God. Did you all hear that? How do, how do you become a gold living stone in the throne of God? You, you believe it, you choose it, and then you believe it. You all see God made this pretty darn simple for us. You all hear that? We've just made it complex. So God made this real simple for you. All you have to do in your Christian life is believe and choose something. And then God God, then God starts to work in your life. How does God work in your life then? Operates speaking Well, see there's two words you have to get down, right? One is believing, right? And the second word is grace. Those are the two issues, right? Remember, remember in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, he says, right? By faith are you saved through grace. Those are the two issues right there. Did you hear them? If you get those two issues down, then everything in your Christian life falls into that category. Did you all hear that? Right? By faith or believing, right? Are you saved through grace? By faith, or you can become a gold stone in the throne of God by grace. That's how simple it is. You make it sound very simple. <laughs> but because we have been brought up either in the wrong system or under the wrong thinking process, we still think we have to do something to earn it. That's correct. And and that's why what you're saying about this being so simple is true. But if we're still caught up in the old way of thinking, we're that's right. we're sinking. <laughs> Was that is that one of your sayings? <laughs> well, that, that, that grace is power. What's that? In that, in that, in that Now, in this whole whole process, you realize the reason why God God's grace has to be involved in this is this, is that what we're talking about here, the end result of what we're talking about here, is so absolutely amazing. It's so incredible, right? That you personally, there is no possible way for you to earn this. There's no possible way for you to work hard enough for it. There's no possible way for you to have enough money to buy. So if none of those things can take place in your life, the only way you can receive this then is by grace. Okay? That's why grace is such an important part of our Christian life that we've, and we're really only starting to grab a hold of how important grace is in these last days, aren't we? Absolutely. Praise God, right? So now we talked about the we talked about the, the material part. Remember I told you every one of these things though represents in your, in your Christian life what? A relationship. Did you hear that, right? So first we talked about the people. Yeah, the people out here didn't have the relationship as the people in here, right? The people who are gold have a relationship here and, the, and some of the other people, maybe some of the other people, 
in this, in this scenario, there's earth in this scenario too, isn't there? There's wood, there's earth. Well, the earth is out here. Okay, the earth is out here. Okay? Praise God, right? Now, the next one we're going to talk about is this one called clothes, okay? In the scripture, there are these clothes, okay? So the high priest, there's a, one in the scripture called a high priest, okay? So the high priest has eight garments on. How many garments do you have on? Eight. Eight. <laughs> so how many garments do you have on? Listen, you get to choose how many garments you put on. Did you all hear that? <coughs> See, some people, some people do not have any garments on. Why don't they have any garments on? Because they've chosen not to put garments on. Did you hear that, right? God is, God, listen, God is not a respecter of people. Remember, many are called. It means everybody's called. But only a few people choose to do these things. Did you hear that right? You need to choose, right, and believe that, that you've got eight garments on. And the next one down is called the priesthood, right? Right? They've got about four garments on, okay? And then the next one's called the Levitical priesthood. And they basically got one garment on, right? And then you got the people outside, and they got zero. Okay? Again, you get to choose how many garments you put on, right? Okay? You notice also in this that we didn't talk about, add this one in there, but you got also got this order of things. You got a high priest, you got a priest, you got a Levitical priest, and then you got the people outside, right? So now you get to decide which one of these you want to be. How many of you want to be a high priest? Me. Listen. The only, one, the only thing holding you back from being a high priest is what? Your choice. Me. It's what you choose and what you believe, right? Absolutely. That's the only thing holding you back. How many high priests we got here? Now, if you want to be a high priest, you better raise your hands up. Because that was what that means is if you haven't <laughs> chosen to be a high priest, doesn't it? Because no. you have to remember in the scripture, this scripture is written in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, and it says, right, in your heart you believe unto righteousness, righteousness but what? It's only half the verse. What's the other half say? But out of your yeah, mouth. Did you hear that? Believe Did you honor? What's that? Believe in your heart. That's right. But you have to realize, without the second half of that, which the second half is, within your mouth you speak unto what? Salvation. Right. You, salvation does not happen. Just because you believe it doesn't make you saved. Well, would you like to? Let me. Okay. If you if you don't believe that, then tell me this one. It says in the scripture that even Satan believes. Well, the only scripture that comes to mind, Doc, is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall. Well, but you have to speak it. That's why this thing is so well, important. That's why you've got to have verse 9 with verse 10. That's right. You, you have to speak these words out of you. People think they can just go along and they can just believe and that's all they have to do, right? No, God wants you to... The reason why, and the reason why you're not speaking it is why. There's an issue about believing when you don't speak it, isn't there? Right? See, when you start believing things, all of a sudden you start talking about them and you start telling other people about it. How many of you have told, in this, in this group here, how many of you out here have told somebody that you're 100% like Jesus? Let's see, how many, let's see, everybody has done it, raise their hand. So we got about half the group here. It means the other half the group has not told anybody that. They look at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. That's well, when you understand. What's that? They think I'm crazy. <laughs> well, that's all right. Crazy like <laughs> There you go, right? 
what you have to, what you don't, what we haven't grabbed a hold of very well about all this is this, is that words, how important are words? So God created, God created everything with a word. Did you know that? So everything was created with a word. How about, how about the angels? Now the angels, here are the angels, right? And the angels, God gave the angels a job. What job did, the, God, did uh, God give the angels to do? He gave the angels jobs to minister, right? He gave them the job to minister to you. So would you like to hear what, hear what the Lord had to say about that? He said the word spoken by the angels are steadfast. Did you hear that, right? Then he goes on to say this. Every word spoken by those angels that is not steadfast is a transgression and disobedience to God. And, er and because of that reason, they will receive a just recompense of reward for it. So if you don't think the words you speak are important, you better think again. <clears throat> That's why these... This is why these words that we're talking about, see, when we're talking about these things, see, about you doing these things, you're all, you, every one of them, you have to say something over yourself, don't you? You have to say you're a living stone, you're a gold living stone. You have to say you're a high priest. You have to, you don't get, you got that idea. Every one of these things, is a word is involved with it. There's no such thing as any of these things not having a word with it. Did you hear that? Okay. That means you have to start speaking over yourself these words that you're gold, that you're a high priest, right? You got that picture? Now, so now we talked about the clothes. Now we have to talk about the structure, right? So in the structure, first, the most important structure is the Ark of the Covenant, right? Remember now, this. what's this all about? Relationships. Every single one of these things we're talking about here is about a relationship. Ark of the Covenant, that's the most important one, right? Then you have this one called the altar of incense, right? Then we have the candlestick. And we have the, the table of showbread. Okay. Then we have the labor. We have the we have the altar of burnt sacrifice. Each one of these represents a relationship. Okay. Praise God, right? Now you get to choose which one of these you are. You get to choose. Are you going to be? Are you going to be the Ark of the Covenant? Well, listen, <laughs> God meant you to be everything. Amen. Listen, how much, listen, this is, this is not just about relationships, it's about how much God loves you. And how much we love him. Well, that's part of it too, isn't it? See, you, you understand this, that God did not plan for you to be out here. That was not God's plan for you, was it? No, I wasn't going to stay out here. See? See, God's plan was for you to be here. Absolutely. That's where I am. See, and so, but, but there's a but in all this, isn't there? And the but is, you have to choose that. Amen. See? Did you know most Christians are not choosing this at all? Remember, if you talk to most Christians and you ask them about themselves, right? What do they tell you about themselves? They're a sinner. Wait a minute now, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> that's what they said. That's the flesh. Sin and say bug rice. Singing that stinking song. Stinking <laughs> <laughs> stinking song. Good person. <laughs> but you understand when a Christian calls himself a sinner. He doesn't glorify God. Well, it's, no. it's not just not glorifying God. You have to realize that you cannot enter into the presence of God with sin. That, that is not allowed, right? 
God will not allow sin to come into his presence. God will not allow darkness to come into his presence. God will not allow corruption to come into his presence. And if those things try to come into his presence, what happens? They get burned up. They get destroyed. The person gets destroyed. So God in his wisdom then, God will not, not allow them in there. In fact, did you know that on the door of the tabernacle, what's on the door of the tabernacle? Two angels. Why two angels? They hold the, the swords of flames of fire. Keep Whoa! That was a revelation, wasn't it? Did you hear that? Say it again. The reason why there's two angels on the door of the tabernacle is there to prevent anybody coming in there that, do not, that does not belong there. They're set there to prevent anybody with sin and corruption and darkness not to enter into the tabernacle of God. That's why those two angels are there. Now those two angels, you have to remember, on the tabernacle door here, is that this is, this is a structure, a man-made structure. Did you all hear that? Yes. It's only a shadow of heaven. The real tabernacle has, guess what it has at the door of the tabernacle? Real. Two real angels, not just pictures of them. <laughs> okay? And those two angels are preventing anybody from coming in there. There's a scripture written in, and there's another scripture that's written in Leviticus chapter 21 where he talks about putting on these white garments, yeah. right? In that scripture there, it talks about having a blemish on those white garments. What if you got a blemish on those white garments? We're not supposed to have it. Wait a minute, I didn't say that. <laughs> Let me see. You don't enter in. If you have a blemish on your garment, you don't get to enter in if you've got a blemish on your garment. Did you all hear that, right? Yes. He says you can eat the bread of the sacrifice, but guess what? You have to eat the bread of the sacrifice outside of the tabernacle. These are all things to teach us about what all this stuff means. God, listen, but remember this, God's love for you. How much does God love you? You hear that? He loves you so much, he wants you to be, where does he want you to be? Right there. Right on the Ark of the Covenant. Did you hear that? In the throne of God. That was his plan for you in the first place, wasn't it? Yes. The only thing preventing you from being there is what? Your choice. It's yourself. It's yourself. Praise God, right? So one of the things you have to do is you have to learn to speak over yourself with the correct words. Yes. Absolutely. You all hear that? Yes. So you need to start getting a different perspective about this whole issue. You have to get this idea about how important these words are. If you're not speaking the correct words over you, then the words that you're speaking over you will come to pass. And that's not good, is it? <laughs> she got the revelation. It's good. Yeah. Or for anybody else. All right. Praise God, but see God, but see, <clears throat> but you have to remember. I told you in these last days, God is opening up our eyes and opening up our understanding and our thinking process about all these things. So, and the reason why He's doing, why is He doing that? Because He loves us. No, that's that's all true. But the real reason He's doing that is because we're getting ready for the la we're getting ready for the end of all this. Amen. Did you hear that right? And so what he's doing, he's trying to prepare you, prepare you to enter in. Absolutely. Okay? So if you're not ready to enter in and all the stuff happens, guess what? Then you're left out, aren't you? Like the bride. Better get in like the bride. There we go, right? Left behind. What's that? Left behind. Left behind. Okay. <laughs> and you have to also realize that what God has done, see, God has, God has prepared me for many, many years to tell you all this stuff. I believe you. Because, you know, as I said to somebody earlier, see, you get to join with me. 
and I'm this peculiar person. I'm this weird person. So you all get to be peculiar and weird, weird with me if you want to, right? But listen, this is what the end is all about, though. You have to understand. He is getting, he is getting the bride ready to enter in. Absolutely. Did you hear that, right? And so, you, and so the bride, what does the bride look like? Me. <laughs> <And> what, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and what do you look like? There we go. See, you look like Jesus. That's right. There we go. You look like Jesus, right? Because Jesus, listen, Jesus can't marry somebody that doesn't look like him. That's not going to happen, is it? No. Praise God. That's why this. This is why this. These Christians calling themselves sinner is such a disastrous statement, isn't it? Listen, do they look like Jesus then? No. That's an unfortunate thing, isn't it? That's a disaster. That's terrible. Change your words. Change your words, right? But see, you, you have to realize when God told me all this stuff 35 to 40 years ago, nobody was talking about any of this stuff. He trusts you. But then what happened over the years, very slowly, hear this? Very slowly, people start talking about being like Jesus. <laughs> Did you hear that, right? So now when you when you listen to a lot of these people that are ministers now, they'll start talking to you about being like Jesus. Did you hear that? But the reason why that's happening, did you hear that? Because God is getting the bride ready. Listen, Jesus will never, God will never do anything unless he gets you, gives you the chance to get prepared for it. Amen. Did you hear that? tells his prophet. And so what he's doing now, he's getting us ready to be the bride of Christ. That moment is coming closer, now, and, closer. closer and closer. Now, we don't know the exact timing of it. We do know, unless I should use a fra different phraseology. We do know the time, and we know the season, but we do not know the year. What is the time? The time is a festival of atonement. Did you hear that? That's the time and the season is the festival of tabernacles. Absolutely. That's the time and the season. We don't know when that's going to happen exactly though. Did you hear that? Okay. So listen. So when I say this to you, and I use this word to you, are you the elect? Yes. yes. Hallelujah, right? Yes. Are you a high priest? Yes. See, are you a gold stone in the throne of God? Amen. See, all these words, these are, you know, this is meant for you to, to, to grab a hold of this and just realize how wonderful God is. How much he loves you. How much he cares about you. That he would do all these things for us. And this, guess what? And we don't deserve any of it. Right? We deserve his love. Praise God, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, as you were talking, it first came to me that lot more revelation to it where, where, you, where it was said do not be unequally yoked and so as the church if we see ourselves this way we will be a bride without spot and without wrinkle today we look at the church and we say well God can't be coming right now because we're full of you sin, the church, even the church is full of sin. Yeah. They're not walking. The, the garment that we wear is we are Lord. that temple. He says it's a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness. But if we're not wearing those clothes, if we choose not to put that on, we're unequally yoked to right. a pure and holy sin. Well, that's a very, actually, what you just said is more important than you actually realize, okay? Because you have to realize that God is, is God, has God called you to be a high priest? Absolutely. Is that a truth or is that not? How many of you are high priests? Me. Now listen, if, if you understand that, then the only person you can actually be equally yoked to is what? Jesus. Is a high priest. And who is the ultimate high priest? Jesus. 
Because the only one you can actually be yoked to then exactly. is Jesus. That's the way God saves That's the revelation. That's the way he saves What's that? That's the way he saves That's the way it's supposed to be, right? Amen. Say it again. The only one the only one you can be equally yoked to is Jesus. Amen. You cannot be if and if you try to be if you try to be yoked to somebody who's not like Jesus, then guess what? You're swimming up the wrong way. <laughs> well, there's something that happened. You, you, we think that what we think, see, in our own human thinking, is that we can take somebody who's not who's not a high priest, and you can you can get yoked to him, and then bring that person up to be a high priest. Woo! Oh! 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 No, that doesn't work, does it? Oh! No! What, they pull you down. Yeah, that's right. They pull you down. The easiest way for you to look at it is, you take a horse, and the horses are uh, got two horses pulling a wagon, and they're pulling the wagon. They're going very quickly, right? Then you take one of the horses off and add a mule to it. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> the, the, warg, the, the wagon does not go faster. It probably doesn't go anywhere, does it? No, it's stubborn. Did you hear that, right? But this is the same issue we got with this. Did you hear that? You are a high priest. You need, and then you need to talk, start talking to these people who are high priests around you. And you need to become yoked to them. Did you all hear that? Because, it, because you can't be yoked to these other people. It just won't work. The only thing it does for you is what? It brings you down. It pulls you down. Praise God, right? That is so good. Now, you, now how many of you are a gold stone? All of us. How many of you are the Ark of the Covenant? <coughs> now, here we are. Now, here are the children of Israel. They're out. They're getting ready to cross the, the Jordan River. Now remember I told you the Jordan River is a boundary to heaven. Okay? So to get across, now the Jordan River at this time was at flood stage. So the only way that they, only way they could get across the Jordan River was by the, by a part of the river drying up, right? Did you hear that, right? So how does the river get dried up? Well, first, so they're going to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant, okay, the instant the priest, now when I say priest now, you have to pay attention. He was not talking about the high priest. He was talking about the priest. This group, they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Where were the high priests? No, they weren't. Where were the high priests? They were the Ark of the Covenant. Did you hear that? The Ark of the Covenant there, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the high priest, the Ark of the Covenant represents the high priest in this picture. And the priest are carrying the Ark across the river. Did you all hear that? Where were the people? How far behind them? Three quarters of a mile. Two thousand cubits. Why weren't the people? Why weren't the people up there? They didn't choose. No. Well, that. Well, that's true. They were, but there, there's a reason why they were. See, and if you read the scripture, what it says, they did not know the way. Do you know the way? Yes. <clears throat> well, how did you learn the way? Our relationship with well, Jesus. And well, no. And the well, it's a relationship, but something else happened to you, okay? Well, no, what happened to you is this. When you received Jesus as your personal Savior, guess what happened to you? You got completely changed. You got, a, DNA. you got a new DNA, but the, you got something else too. What else did you get? The mind of Christ. You got the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. So now, and he did that for a reason. Did you hear that? The reason he did it so you do what? So you would what? Know what? No so you would know the way. So you would have his thoughts and know the way. Did you hear that? Right. He is the way. That's right. 
And so when they crossed the Jordan River, they had to know the way. The Jordan River is a boundary of heaven. If you don't know the way, you can't get across the river. <laughs> What's that? No, you can't if you don't. That's right. That one uh, comes to me, narrow is... Narrow is the way. And few find it. Well, you left out part of it. <laughs> you could tell she was going to. Narrow is the way, and narrow is the gate. Gate. The gate. And few there are that enter in there. Now, what gate is he talking about? So we get this picture back up here. There's a gate. Would you like to know where the gate is? Here's the gate. Mm -hmm. This is the gate. Yeah. That's the gate. That's the gate. Now, this whole thing here represents... Jerusalem, did you hear that? It represents Jerusalem. It's also it's called the mountain of the Lord. Did you hear that? So when you enter the gate, you're entering into Jerusalem, or you're entering into the mountain of the Lord. So he says, narrow is the way, right? Right? And narrow is this gate, and few that are that enter in through that gate. Okay? That is not the door though. Over here's the door. This is the door here, okay? Here's the door. They got actually got two doors. But this is the door of the Holy of Horror. That's the door that God wants you to go through because inside that, now you have to remember that there's a <clears throat> this curtain here though has been broken. But you have to realize spiritually that curtain's still there. But you can go through the curtain. The only thing holding you back from going through the curtain is what? What you see, what you believe, and what you choose. Did you hear that? <laughs> okay, you got that picture. So the door here then is a whole different ball game. See, see. So the people now remember I told you the people couldn't enter in, but they could go through. When you read the scripture, it talks about, and this is written in uh, Revelation chapter twenty-one, right? Twenty-one. It talks about that. All the nations, all the kings of the nations. Oh, did you hear that one? We're talking about the new heaven and the new earth, and there's kings on the earth of the new heaven and the new earth. So these people out here have what over them? Kings or chiefs. Okay. So they, so they come around like this, and then they go through here, and then they go over here, and they go up here, and then they offer their sacrifice there. Okay. And then they go around this way, and they leave this way, and come back where they started. Okay, that's how it worked. So now the so the priest, the Levitical priest, right? They would take their sacrifices and take them in here, and here would be the altar of burnt sacrifice and the laver. And then they would put their sacrifice on the altar. The people, though, never were allowed in here. <coughs> okay. So now you. This whole thing about this talk was this. You are the elect. Right? You get to choose whether you want to be the elect. You're the high priest. You get to choose whether you want to be a high priest. You are the Ark of the Covenant. You get to choose whether you want to be the Ark of the Covenant. The high priest has eight garments on. You get to choose how many garments you put on. Now, if you want to understand all this stuff, some of the stuff you need to start studying in the scripture and, and read it for yourself, right? It's all written in there. See, God, remember I told you, God wrote all this stuff in there to teach you. Teach you about what? Relationship. Relationship. How are you doing with that? Great. Well, let's just pray. Now, one of the things I want you to stand up. Everybody stand up. Because one of the things we need to practice doing, because in Psalms 100, it says, right, you enter the gates. Remember, that's the gate thing we talked about. With what? Thanksgiving. With Thanksgiving. You enter the door, the, the courts, not the door, the courts with what? Praise. Praise. How do you get inside the Holy of Holies? Jesus. No, you get in... You get inside the Holy of Holies by singing. It's all written in Psalms 100. Okay? So God wants us to learn how to sing, but he wants you to sing. Remember, God wants somebody to worship him. He's going to worship him how? In spirit and in truth. Listen, 
because of our human nature, we can't technically sing to him in truth. I'm ready. Did you all hear that? I'm so, so the way you the way you get around that is you do what? Sing in tongues. You sing in the spirit. How many of you are singing in the spirit? So now what you, I want you to do now, I want you to raise your hands up because there's a scripture that's written in Psalms 134 where it talks about standing in the holy place with your hands lifted up. <coughs> Praise God. So I want you to stand in the holy place. Do you hear that? I want you to, I want you to sing in the spirit and I want you to have a vision because he says in the scripture, without a vision you perish. So I want you to enter into the, I want you to enter into, through that door into the Holy of Holies and be seated on the throne with him. Are you all ready? Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Let's start singing then. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. Now the Lord spoke to me, said this to you. Are you ready? He said that there's some among you here who have some ailments. And the reason you have some ailments is because we have not put that under our feet. But Jesus, right? Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is walking here among us right now. And Jesus is walking here among us here to put all those issues, all those problems, all those ailments, all those things under his feet, under your feet. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? So in the name of Jesus now, we just take authority over every single one of those ailments. Those ailments do not belong to us. Hallelujah, Jesus. And so right now, in the name of Jesus, we cast out every single one of those right now in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. We put those under our feet in the name of Jesus. I want you to now, I want you to step, throw that down under your feet. Throw it down. Now I want you to stamp on it. Stamp on it. Stamp on all those things that are causing you problems. They belong under your feet. They don't belong, they don't belong in you. They belong under your feet in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God, right? And we thank you for that. Now, Jesus, we thank you, Jesus, that you're here with us, Jesus. Now, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that the words that you speak now are words that have life, words that have blessing, the words that are going to change everything about you. And when, you, when you're all changed, all the people around you are going to get changed, too. And we thank you for Jesus for this. In Jesus' precious name now, amen. Amen.